Please join me in welcoming our guest speakers and the panelists. Heather Brown from Tidewater Community College. Paige Durhan from Germana Community College. Uh, both of those colleges are in the state of Virginia. Kim Iftis from Tarrant County College in Texas. Anna Henny Withrow from Florida Southwestern State College in Florida. James Hardin from University of Alabama in Alabama. Stella Lewis from Barry University in Florida. Laura McNeil from University of Alabama in Alabama. Atula Ozna from Tarrant County College, Texas. I will start a question to get the panel uh, started, and then I will take turns with the audience to ask our guest speakers questions. So uh, please follow our policy and lore and webinar etiquette when participating. Thank you. My first question to the panels is, based on your own practices, as well as on what you have observed and learned from colleagues on other campuses, what is the current situation of generative AI use in higher education classrooms? Panelists, please feel free to jump in. Thank you. Hi, I'll jump in. This is Laura McNeil from UA. And what I'm observing on our campus is that we have a small group of faculty who are early adopters. They're usually very tech fluent. And, uh, but, but they definitely think AI integration isn't a replacement for our proven teaching practices. Um, most of our instructors are a little hesitant around AI use, uh, worried about reliability and credibility. Um, so there, there's interest though. I think they're wanting to learn more about AI and how it can be integrated into their practices. And UA has adopted MS Copilot for faculty and staff that's relatively new. And rather than a policy, Alabama developed guidelines, which I think is a, a softer way to approach the issue uh, because faculty and staff will be using it anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to add on to, to Laura's point, UA's policies allow flexibility so that faculty have choices in how much AI they want to bring into their courses, into their designs, um, whether that's a little, a lot, or none. Um, and, and, and the Microsoft Copilot that she mentioned really kind of demonstrates um, a level of commitment from the institution in that that is not a free tool. It is actually quite an expensive tool. Um, you know, so yeah, it's it's exciting. I do see um, people are at least thinking and exploring about it, and I, I see people more a little bit more open to the idea than maybe six, you know, eight, ten months ago, which is really exciting. That's the same with us, um, James. Is that the more at Tidewater Community College in Virginia, uh, I've been. Uh, a very early adopter of AI and starting the webinars and, and some workshops. And uh, it's this is February. And so I think our first workshop was in February of last year. Um, and now this semester, we have had about six workshops on AI. And with each one, I see the numbers increasing of faculty attending. Um, I feel like our faculty uh, are opening up, warming up, I guess you could say, to AI. We do still have a good population, um, very hesitant, um, inquisitive, but hesitant. We have some guidelines in place um, or guardrails, if you, if you will. We do have some um, policy written, not policy, excuse me, syllabi, um statements that faculty can look at they can utilize if they want they can change the verbiage if they want but we've left that up to the faculty member um but i feel from from a benchmark of last year at this time to where we are today um as we 
continue to um, present information on AI, our faculty are starting to um, uh, open up a little bit more than they had been um, in previous in the previous year. I would agree. I think there's a, a move onward from being super focused on AI misuse to um, really looking at the broader implications across the institution, the implications for our students as they are moving into careers, and really the cultural and societal implications. So we've been having um, AI open forums every Thursday on Zoom at the college level. It's a great way to hear the student voice in the conversation. And I think that's been really empowering for faculty um, to start to, to hear from their students outside the classroom about what their fears are and what their own um, uses are and so on. Thank you so much for our panelists for sharing. Um, our panelist group, do you have other uh, uh, comments or sharing regarding this first question? Please feel free. I'd like to add a little. Um, we're the online campus for our district. We're fully online, and so we are looking at all aspects of AI use, including training our students and how to use it. And um, we have a section of our campus that falls under our president. It is our corporate solutions and economic development department. And they actually partner with the corporate uh, uh, entities in our area to provide professional development, internships, partnerships with the college. And we are seeing a huge increase in requests from the corporate world as well for our college to provide not only training for their employees, but to provide certifications and students who are graduating from our, our two-year college with AI experience. So it's not just an academic thing, in corporate world are really past the old, you know, oh, can we leverage this in our business? And they're looking at educational institutions and higher ed to provide some of that training and produce graduates and, and certified individuals that experience. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, also uh, one, of, one of the other things, I think early on um, our sort of exposure to, you know, uh, Kim and I are, are at the same institution, but uh, some of our exposure to generative AI tools uh, were more on the academic side. Uh, you know, I think it was really faculty driven. And uh, what we're starting to get into at our institution is conversations around how, how, um, how what integration looks like uh, from a uh, operation standpoint. And so uh, we put together a task force at our institution that's exploring essentially a strategy, uh, an institutional strategy for uh, what that looks like. Um, and so there's several of us who are part of that, uh, part of those conversations who are now looking at, um, you know, uh, you know, what impact this is going to have on, on, on student services, on you know, on other aspects of the institution uh, beyond just IT or, or HR, you know, I mean, we're looking at all aspects. So I think for us, it's it's exciting to see it um, uh, from where it started, which was really, uh, as some of the other panelists mentioned, um, you know, what disruption is this going to have to, um, you know, academic integrity to more, all right, how are we leveraging this tool uh, to make sure that we're more efficient and and to make sure that we're preparing our students for a you know a, a, a future that's AI integrated. Thank you, Arturo. Uh, um, just to just to add one more thing, Tom, and that is um, uh, my uh, uh, my colleagues there's still a lot of policing that's going on. You know, it, it, they're really afraid of the plagiarism and um, chasing that down. And it's really hard to get past that bump that, that it's hard to get past that mindset. So, you know, not uh, as the saying goes, uh, just saying, not judging. So, uh, uh, but I think that it's important that we keep moving ahead in this so that we can see how it is that we can, um, how it is that we can incorporate this uh, and help others to do that without that fear factor. I will tell you that um, 
uh, in the classes that I've uh, used AI, this is what I found is that students generally don't know about it. And when they do or don't, they're really excited to learn about it. And the ones that have graduated uh, since last year, I've gotten two calls from students, which, you know, when you get a call from a student, you're you're either panicked or delighted. And um, they told me that they got the job because they knew AI. Um, and that one of them got a, a very big bump in pay and the other one got the job because they knew AI. So I think that we really need to uh, push that piece. Thank you, Thela. So now the uh, asking question opportunity goes to the audience members, to the audience. Uh, if you want to ask a question, Please feel free to click on raise hand icon on bottom of your Zoom screen. Also, you can feel free to type your question and submit it in Q and A area. Uh, so once you we see the raise hand icon um, uh, for question or comment, uh, we will uh, call you uh, based on the order received. So we have uh, 114 people in the room. There must be some questions. Please feel free. Okay. Uh, Jack asked in uh, Q&A, what kind of wedding does any institution do, do regarding the privacy or agreements of AI platforms? Thank you, Jack. Our uh, panelists, what do you think? That's not my area, my particular area. I'm sorry, who is getting ready to speak? I apologize for speaking over you. But um, um, I think that's something that the institution are uh, that we are looking at um, in terms of uh, the different AI platforms. Um, yeah, that's what I have to say on that. There, we're in the process of really taking a holistic look at AI, um, not only from the teaching and learning standpoint, but from information services, data privacy, um, and all of that, uh, and coming up with maybe not even having to come up. There are other institutions and even um, UK and Canadian institutions that have started the process of creating checklists and um uh institutional check checklist uh per se for these privacy and agreements for um ai platforms absolutely it's somebody who works really closely with our it department for software acquisition it's it's got to become part of our process of vetting right if we're going to use a tool um, and especially for us as an online campus, all of our tools are digital, right? So we really need to look at, just like we look at a VPAT statement, just like we look at ADA compliance, just like we look at privacy and security and safety information, those kinds of things working together with your um, IT department. Um, I put a question like this in for the panel earlier um, that uh, we've got to work together. We've got to look at what information um, are we sharing? What, you know, how do we also train our faculty and students to know that what you upload goes out, right? So it, it's it's um it's going to behoove these AI providers, these AI um, uh, software application providers to make sure that they're being very transparent with their safety, security, and privacy measures. But we're also, as user, end users, going to have to demand that, right? Uh, because when we start looking at how much of this information is really going out, it's going to freak some people out and your IT departments are going to just slam the door, right? So we've got to get these AI uh, providers to recognize the need for transparency and the need for some control in that to ensure that we're meeting uh, regulations and, and, and protecting privacy. Then it's training for faculty, for staff, for students, so that everyone understands when you use this tool, here's what you're agreeing to. But if we do that, I think we can avoid some of the instances where we run into where whole whole universities are refusing to allow it, right? That, that districts are blocking it. And we start addressing it like we address any other technological tool. There is a set of guidelines. We have a set of regulations. We meet that. Um, we have a, a system here in Texas called text ramps where software applications have to go through a statewide um, process to vet them. So AI providers should start looking at some of those opportunities to get their house in order, get their stuff transparent, and then 
market that those are the kinds of services they're offering for educational institutions that have to meet those, those federal and state and local requirements. I'll just add for um, instructional designers and faculty members to keep in mind that if you're designing assignments um, in which students are being asked to use AI, to know very carefully about those tools. And I think it's a best practice to give alternatives in the case that a student is not comfortable with an AI tool. So for example, I teach a class where I say, you can use an AI collaborator for this, here's how you would do that. Or you could use a human collaborator for this and here's how you would do that. I Thank you. think that yeah, what's sure. important is that um, uh, we need to start thinking, uh, those folks that use AI and folks in general in hiring need to start thinking about the philosophy behind um, AI and really get to how is it that AI, um, uh, I don't want to say the word thinks, but comes up with their data. How is that familiar with how a person does it? How is it that it's constructed? Those are all philosophical questions that we need to struggle with. Not here, because this is a practical hands-on application day. But those are big thoughts for another day that we're all going to have to struggle with and have fun in doing that because we're all nerds and that's what we like to do. But that's something that we need to move forward towards. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, Jack, for that great question. And now uh, it's my turn to ask the panel a second question. And I noticed uh, uh, there are multiple questions being submitted in Q&A area. So uh, please bear with me. I will um, let you ask your question. So uh, just as what we uh, talked about regarding the uh, students' privacy and uh, all those kind of uh, uh, very important issues. And um, my question is uh, to, to the panel, um, has your institution gone through an AI readiness assessment or uh, is your institution looking at creating guidelines or um, policies or has your institution already created the guidelines for AI use or policies for AI use among faculty, staff, and the students? Well, I've already mentioned it, but um, University of Alabama has come up with a policy um, and um, they, mainly it focuses on experimenting and learning the AI tools, explaining the AI tools explicitly in classes, uh, changing assignments so that they can't easily be completed using AI and move to more authentic assessments with performance elements. And that's a really high level that it's, it's much more detailed in, um, in the uh, website itself. But I think that uh, from a teaching perspective and an instructional design perspective, I think it can be woven into the fabric of classes and not necessarily make the class about AI, but this is how we use this tool as we complete this assignment. This is the appropriate way to use it. Um, speaking about privacy, I was just talking to another faculty member in social work, and she won't allow her students who are undergraduates to use it because they're not as careful about sharing these family names and these children's names and their birth dates and all of these things that you collect as social workers. So we really, really have to educate our students about how, it, how to use this safely. Thank you, Lola. Uh, I have a follow-up question. Uh, would you please, uh, are you able to share uh, your institution's AI use policy with us? Thank you. Okay, uh, to our uh, panelists, do you have other comments or uh, sharing regarding this question or topic? Um, I, I actually do. I'm so sorry to be jumping in again. But since you said social work, of course, I have to jump in. Um, I'm, a so I'm a social worker. So one of the things that we always push is um, uh, that you never, ever uh, put 
uh, client names, descriptions, etc., who, who can be identified, right? So it's all about um, uh, holding the values and ethics of the profession um, to begin with. So it's about teaching that piece and about good citizenship um, and what it means to use AI. I, I know one of my students is on here today, um, but one of the things that we did in our, uh, our BSW program, our bachelor's program, is that at the end of every class, we would have a teach me something new moment. And it was so awesome that the students were able to point out what it was that they, I learned so much from them. And uh, we just really all learned together around the ethics of the use, as well as the tool itself, and found that um, uh, students are really powerful teachers for, for other students. And it really works for them about um, following that good citizenship, being good citizens. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I do want to say, so some of our, we did provide some guidance. So uh, part of our faculty association uh, created a, a committee over um, uh, last semester. And we started talking about providing guidance uh, for faculty. And so we we did draft up um, what we considered guidance with sample syllabi. I know a lot of the other institutions sort of did uh, something similar uh, in an effort to uh, provide some information about w what this technology is uh, and some potential uses for it, but also some implications uh, of of how students may or may not use the tool, but then also providing some syllabus statements, some sample syllabus statements uh, and things of that nature. So that's something we did provide institution-wide now, again, on the other side, sort of looking at the institution and its use, um, we're, we're starting to... Uh, talk about the need for a general, almost like you have a, a general computer use policy, something along those lines uh, for the use of, of, of these tools. Uh, I know specifically, um, it, you know, we're, we're learning designers, instructional designers in, in my department. Uh, uh, we started to create our own sort of guide lines and guide rails, right? Based on what we thought was ethical and appropriate, right? And so the models that we've been using, uh, we've always used this term to describe them, which is AI-assisted, human-driven. Uh, and so that's that's how we uh, essentially approach the work that we're doing in, in instructional design with the models that we're uh, developing. Um, and and we just take that approach. We, you know, we believe that, um, the subject matter expert and instructional design roles are still valuable in that process. And so we've done uh, uh, a lot of work in promoting a model that preserves those roles. And so uh, certainly that's something that we've been um, advocating for and promoting as part of our work as learning designers. I shared our guidance for our faculty um, that our current work and I worked on that committee and Arturo is currently on the committee for the district for um, more work. I will say our district is looking at creating positions and um, regarding AI so that there are, are people who are well versed who can and create a consistent uh, constant, if not policy, then procedures and protocols. Um, right. Because policy is a big word. Got to go to the board. Um, and with technology changing as fast as it is, this may be something that's more of a protocol procedure kind of thing. But um, we also shared, I also shared, um, Arturo and I do a lot um, of talking about that AI-assisted uh, AI human-driven model. So we have a prompting guide. I shared that. It's um, geared towards IDs in the chat as well um, to share because I'm seeing a lot of comments in the chat about sharing information and where do we go to work together. So I've dumped that in there for you as well. But it is, it's incredibly important to have those options. I think Sarah was talking about having the students help share. Um, one of the ways to help get our faculty lists scared about it is to talk to them about how they can do it, to give them examples, show them that verbiage so that they feel supported. Because um, I know when we first started, the very first thing everyone said is, how do I block it? How do I stop it? How do I tell them they're not allowed to do it? But we also provided, and I will say Arturo authored, two other paragraphs that allow it within parameters provided by the teacher 
and then openly but with transparency, citation, that and reflection, right? We not only say, yes, you can do it, but then you have to explain what the prompt you used, why you used that prompt, how you thought it returned your, your response and what you felt about that. So I think as IDs, we're really going to have to start looking at helping our faculty to build um, course artifacts using AI for students to use AI that help explain these things. Right. First, explain it to our faculty. How can I create an activity for my students that has all this? And then how can I help my students to work through that process? But all of that's got to start kind of higher up with those consistent protocols from the institutional level. And I know up front there was a lot of frustration at our university because it was silent. Our, our upper leadership didn't didn't know what to say about it. So they weren't saying anything. And um, it was a faculty push to get guidelines written because they needed that consistency. They wanted to know that they had support from the leadership about if I don't use it, if I do use it, if I sort of use it. So I think it's it's going to behoove higher education as a whole to really start looking at solidifying those definitions and reaching out and, and finding some consistency across community colleges and universities um, to make sure that we're all using the same vocabulary, that we have the same definitions, much as we do with technology, right? With online learning and blended learning and hybrid learning. And, and we, we need to look at this as a higher level of standards that we have for this, and then the institutions can add their pieces. But that way faculty can lose some of that fear because this is something that is sort of being monitored and is being defined and being supported. So I feel like um, we're at a really good opportunity, to, especially with conversations like this, to start working together and, and uh, break down some silos and really try to come up with an educational approach to the AI usage as a whole, as a field. Thank you, Kim. And thank you, everybody. Uh, let's come back to the audience questions in Q&A. Uh, certainly, uh, our panel might have already uh, covered some of those uh, questions, but uh, I still would like to uh, look at those questions and see whether you have more to add. Uh, Fatuna asked, which departments are partnering with your faculty to assist in incorporating AI into courses? And uh, uh, he uh, is a, an instructional designer. So uh, do you have any um, uh, suggestions for him? And we did mention uh, the IT departments and uh, pretty much a lot of uh, uh, stakeholders that needs to be involved. Um, and so, uh, but I just want to check with our uh, panel. Uh, do you have uh, more suggestions? Thanks. Hi. I actually do. We have a great guy who I think is on here today, too. His name is Jeff Larson, and he's fantastic over in distance learning. Um, one of the things that he figured out is that uh, what we believe oftentimes isn't reality. So uh, we found that um, our students, uh, Jeff did a survey and found that we were so afraid that our students were going to be cheating and, and what he did, found on this survey was that the students wouldn't use it because they were so afraid they would be cheating. So, uh, which was, it caught us off guard going, wow, that's crazy. So um, uh, what, it, what it showed me was that, you know, like I said before, I'm a social worker. So I'm always one of those rose colored glasses and thinking, that people really want to be good. And I think that students want to be good students and that we need to facilitate that for them and um, uh, give, them some, uh, uh, give them some boundaries around that. And it's not so that they don't cheat, it's so that they can use it wisely. And uh, uh, you know that trust really works. It, it works both ways. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you so much, Jeff, for doing those uh, great research to back up our practice. So thanks. And was, was the question around how is the university providing information to faculty? Yeah, how instructional designers can uh, find allies and partners for the AI, AI uh, use uh, integration in classrooms. Yeah, right. Laura, I was uh, going to mention what Dr. Major is doing over in her new facility. Is that where you were headed? 
that that's where I'm headed. And um, I work part time at our University of Alabama Teaching Academy. And as James mentioned, we're kind of leading the charge on how AI can be integrated into courses, how faculty can use them. And we had two speakers a couple of weeks ago actually do demos and uh, talk about how they use AI in their courses. And then we have a contingent over in arts and sciences who deal specifically with ethics and legal usage. And so they Mm -hmm. share a lot of information with uh, arts and sciences folks. But of course, I go over and crash the party as often as I can. Right. And this is it's been a really good resource for the university, that whole academy. But, yeah, they are really starting to have those conversations campus wide, specifically for faculty about AI and how, you know, all the things that we're talking about, how they can use it within their classes. So it's a it's a really excellent resource. And I'm glad that we're uh, we're getting launched at our institution. And I'm uh, currently putting together a course for this summer uh, that integrates generative AI with instructional design. So, and it goes through uh, a lot of, you know, what should we be using? How should we be using it? So, um, yeah, so future IDs. Thank you so much, Lola and James. I'd like to encourage people to also look at partnering with your CE department. If you have a continuing education department in your university, working with them to provide certifications, to provide training for the community and for businesses. Again, we have an entire department that is corporate solutions and economic development. And they are um, they are actually they bring in funds um, by working with community members, uh, corporate members. So you have an opportunity there to really hear what the corporate world and the community are interested in to provide um, opportunities for certification and training to to deal with some of that. And that can kind of help you work with your IT department as well in a non-academic environment to work out some of the bumps and bruises before you try to bring that in environment if you're running into some some pushback from your IT department. But um, I'm a big fan and always have been in my 25 years as an ed tech of find those champions, right? We had a few people mention they've got some that find those rock stars who are willing to give it a go and who are not afraid to fail and and who will give you that really good feedback. We always like to bring feedback and data back when we try things like this. What's working? What's not working? Here's what we found. And then we build webinars and trainings and we talk to our faculty based on that information. So, um, but there are some non-academic partners at the school that can help you move forward at a faster pace um, because you don't have to deal with all of the academic um, stigma that comes with some of this and some of the the um, privacy issues, right? You can work with that CE department and community ed to try to build your AI program. And then that will start to trickle in as people realize they want it over here. We need to be providing it over here. So I just wanted to put that out as an idea. If you're running into pushback, start working with some of those non-academic partners to get that program going and it will trickle into your academic program. Oh, I wanted to mention that Paige uh, put in the chat that having workshops on campus for staff uh, has been very helpful. They had an AI day for the entire college, and it was more a play with AI feel, which I really love. It makes it so much more um, approachable, I think. And I forgot Alabama's having its own uh, online learning innovation summit March 1st, and it's AI themed. So we have faculty and graduate students all presenting. I, I don't even know how many presentations we'll have, but it's a full day, uh, probably 40 different presentations, a lot of them tackling different aspects of AI. So that's been, and yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, Lola. I, I did want to add one thing. Uh, one of the ways we're approaching sort of thinking about integration, and I've done a couple of sessions on this now, uh, is uh, we're using this, this uh, what's called the SAM, the SAMR model. And um, I'll post a link to an article here about this. But essentially what it is, is um, there's really different ways that you can, different levels of engagement that are available, essentially. And so what, when we talk to faculty about how they're approaching it or how they can approach integrating uh, these technologies. We really um, like to use this model to to think about 
uh, what level of engagement they're going to have, you know, and and then uh, I provide examples of things uh, that are that are low hanging, right? Like substitution things, uh, examples uh, like like you know, for ex- for example, one of them is uh, re- replacing your your test questions, right? Having generative AI write certain test questions. That's that's an example of substitution. It's 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 really not changing anything that you're doing, other than you're you're you know you're doing. Uh, you're, you're changing your test questions, right? And then you get into the redefinitions and that's, you know, I'll, I provide an example of I'm, I'm creating a bot for one of my courses. And, and, uh, and so that's an example of, of redefinition. So uh, I, I found that using this model has been really great to, to articulate in sort of digestible ways, how you can incorporate in, and integrate uh, the use of generative AI. So certainly that's something uh, I would, uh, promote and advocate for. Thank you, Atulo. And those are all great insights. And uh, uh, I want to uh, point out that based on uh, our observation, you know, it's not only using AI in, for instructional purposes, and also it can be uh, integrated on uh, all factors or aspects or, uh, of the uh, institution operations. Uh, to enhance uh, efficiency, and uh, you know, uh, for example, for uh, uh, student uh, recruiting and uh, those kinds of things, just uh, as an example, and uh, by introducing into some AI-assisted uh, approach, might uh, be able to greatly enhance the efficiency of operations. So do keep that in mind, and uh, but uh, it's all very uh, good to start uh, with. Uh, finding your allies and the partners and uh, to start uh, the uh, integration of AI, uh, either for instructional purposes and for or non-instructional purposes. And so uh, thank you very much for sharing. And I will mark uh, this question as being answered. And uh, in Q&A, Kirk also asked a very good question uh, regarding the guidelines and the policies, I think we already uh, tried our best to, to cover this. And uh, um, uh, for panelists, if you have more resources to share with Kirk, please uh, feel free to put in chat. And also, Kirk, go to chat. And uh, uh, I already saw multiple resources regarding the guidelines and the policies. Uh, examples have, have been shared in chat. So I will mark uh, your question as answered as well. So. Thank you, Kirk, for asking that question. Dr. Lukers asked the question, uh, what resources are available to share with faculty at a community college that are just uh, learning about AI? I think uh, this is uh, very common for most of us uh, uh, in this uh, time. And um, uh, I also observed and noticed that uh, a lot of uh, helpful resources has been shared uh, in chat. And uh, in addition to that, um, uh, can our uh, panelists just uh, provide some quick and brief answer to this question, please? I think it's important to remember that our disciplines are engaged in this. And so when faculty um, come to you and, um, you know, do your best to serve them, obviously, but let them know also, hey, you know, MLA um, and the four C's, for example, have a really robust working group that's put out a lot of um, guidance in um, humanities disciplines. So I, I like to direct faculty to um, see what their colleagues across uh, the globe are saying about it. Thank you, Anna. I, I found that Educause has an AI uh, work group. Um, they, there's conversations every day on that. And then uh, AECT, which is popular for instructional designers and, and faculty uh, also puts out some useful information and some research that's going on. I put a link to that AI community group in the chat. Yeah, and I, you know, also the LinkedIn's been a really great resource as well. <laughs> um, a lot of organic you know, uh, sharing of information, it's unreal. Um, I've learned a lot and I follow, you know, a handful of people. And it's just one thing I noticed is, you know, in the beginning, uh, beginning of last year, um, you know, there, there were definitely 
uh, we're feeling our way. And now it's like this whole new group. When I was saying that, you know, is more more we talk about it, the more people are opening up to uh, receiving AI as a human collaborator. So, you know, I've noticed that the that the LinkedIn information, we're getting a whole new round of individuals coming in and sharing what they're learning now. Um, because, you know, after a year, we're kind of going through our same old, you know, we have our same people we follow. And now there's a whole new group of people that are experimenting with AI. And it's exciting because they're bringing in new use cases. And it's like, oh, wow, that's awesome. I you know, didn't even think about that. So um, I would suggest also, you know, looking at looking to LinkedIn and 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 finding and finding some people to to pay attention to. Right. And I just got back from TCA in Texas. That's our Texas Computer Educators Association um, big conference, and it's it's very heavily K twelve. And um, one of the people in my department and I are working on a K twelve series of AI. And we are doing it um, by content area. We Our first presentation was on AI in the special education classroom. And we work on that for, and we provide actual prompts and, and, and practical application for faculty use and student use in those classroom environments. So we're doing, you know, we're going to do math, we're going to do science, we're going to do social studies, we're going to do art, we're going to do all of that. Um, so it's coming up in K-12. If you go to any of the K-12 conferences, it's everywhere, Magic, uh, Magic School AI is all over the place in K-12. So it is super heavy. So you're gonna start seeing students coming up from the K-12 environment who already know more about AI than your instructors. So we're really going to have to get on top of this because the students coming up are already starting to use it in their classrooms in K-12. They are here in Texas. I'm sure it's the same elsewhere. So it's an, again, important for us to really be looking at what's coming because uh, our students are going to drive that push for AI. They're gonna get into college and go, what, we can't use AI, what? You know, so it's going to be insane. So, um, but it, it, I can't tell you, I mean, our, our session was packed. People are just clamoring for it in the K-12 market. So it's coming our way up from the bottom as well. So we've really got to get a handle on what we're going to do as higher education so that we can, we can, you know, ride that wave and really help our students to come out of, you know, their two and four year institutions with marketable, usable skills that are going to really help them advance in their careers and their personal lives. So, um, but it is coming from the K-12 um, area as well. And I would kind of echo that. Um, I do a lot of work because I'm, I'm in the College of Education and um, there are there are a tremendous amount of AI resources geared and marketed specifically for K-12 institutions. And um, I was actually presenting yesterday at, at a Future Teachers of Alabama conference and there was an AI theme to it. Lots of students there talking about how they use it and what they use it for and how they've already found different resources that I didn't even know about, which is, is really cool to see. So you're right. I, I do think um, it's going to open up the doors for higher mm -hmm. ed. They're going to be forced to. Thank you, James. We have more questions in Q&A and also it's uh, 2.48. Please feel free to hang out with us for a few more minutes if your schedule allows. And I just put in chat to invite you to participate in a very brief survey for pure IDN improvement purpose. So uh, before you leave today, please fill out that short brief survey and provide us feedback. So thank you very much. I just wanted to put out there that um... Uh, I know that I have in the past, I'm going to get open myself up here, but I know that I have in the past uh, when schools have called me to come in and do a session for them for an hour or whatever, I am happy to pop my head in to either talk to faculty or to groups of faculty. Um, and, you know, I, I generally, for an hour, I'm not going to charge someone to do it. If I were to do it for a day, I would, but for an hour, I, I generally don't. And, um, uh, I put in the, uh, chat box, chat, uh, that, um, uh, a prophet in their own land, um, usually is, uh, falls flat. So it's nice to bring someone else in, um, to just have a word and, uh, share a table with others. And I think that it goes a long way with faculty.
That's so true, Sarah. I mean, I have put on so many webinars at our college, right? And then I get Paige from Germana to come in. And, you know, I might have had a handful of people, you know, and I say handful, maybe three or four. And, and that was in the beginning. And even, you know, even in the fall semester. But I get Paige and her colleagues to come on and do an AI and education webinar. And I mean, we had an enormous showing and it was, they were like, oh my God, it's so cool. Blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, you're brilliant. Oh my gosh. We've never heard this before. Right. But it's so true. I mean, if, if they're not ready to receive, right. But it is, it is so true. And, and thank you, Paige. Um, she's been a trooper um, of coming and speaking to our, our, you know, our faculty and our community, we're in the same um, co community college system and it's just great, you know, and, and I love it. So I pre and I, and I appreciate um, just the camaraderie and the willingness of sharing of all the resources and what insights people have. I've just been amazed. It's been awesome. Thank you. Certainly just like uh, what happened 10, 15 years ago, uh, Whenever there is a need, there is an app. And I'm not sure whether we can say nowadays, uh, well, whenever there is a need, there is an AI behind it. Uh, yeah, thank you, Paige, for sharing all those uh, wonderful resources. And uh, we know uh, who we can go to when, if we have the question. So thank you. From previous conversations and interactions, uh, I'm aware that uh, in our audience, there is at least one student in our audience. Dr. Thela Lewis, student Chewa is with us in the audience. And Chewa, I just wonder uh, if it's possible, I'd like to invite you to make some comments regarding this adventure. Uh, we, we want to hear the student voice. If you are able to use your microphone to share your insights, uh, or if you can type in chat, please feel free to do so. Please. Put in chat, do you uh, want to do it or uh, just, uh, you know, whatever. I respect uh, your decision. Okay. I thought you enabled your microphone, Cheva. Please feel free. Oh, my. Um, hi, I am Treva Jones. I'm Dr. Lewis's student, and I'm also her, her um, GA. And um, I'm graduating from Barry, May the 10th, doctoral program in Dr. Lewis just basically gave me life. I'm almost about to cry because um, I have a private practice in Atlanta and I have been working around art and different innovations and I'm feeling like an island on my own. But I'm oftentimes hesitant to share how I get the healing to the patients because of the criticisms or the judgments around technology and AI specifically. I'm an evacuee from New Orleans. I came to Atlanta as a result of Hurricane Katrina and we relied heavily on technology to mark ourselves safe. And that has been like a part of my life since. And so I've been integrating um, EMDR and technology, specifically AI generated art to bring healing to children and people who suffer trauma and when I met her three years ago, I felt like I was no longer a fish out of water because um, pe social workers don't normally tie technology into their work. And so she basically welcomed me. And so I've been able to really build just knowing that I'm not going to be judged for the way that I have to treat my patients. And so one of the ways that I found to be helpful is because I'm a trauma responder and I don't have all the answers. And so I'm going to go to maybe one of the secure AI tools and say, what do I need to do to help this eight-year-old African-American male who will not see a superhero that look like him? And then I'm going to get some ideas from the prompts there. And then I'm going to create that African-American superhero who look like him and bring his Fs from a from an F to at least to a D and from a D to a C. And so I've been hanging on with um, Dr. Lewis for dear life. And I told her she's never going to be able to break up with me because I found my people. I found social work and I found technology meeting hand in hand. And so I told her I'm just in her life, whether she invites me or not. <laughs> so when she had this, she didn't tell me 
I think our dean told us or something. And so I canceled my appointments because I'm at work. I'm like, I have to be here because they, like she said, she is a prophet and I needed that. And I've been able to make major changes just here in Atlanta because of my attachment to her in Florida. So thank you for giving me the floor. I hope to hear a whole, a whole lot more about what you guys are doing. Um, I believe not only bachelor's level, MSW, PhDs, DSW, I believe all helpers should know how to use AI because it becomes a personal assistant that I get to use in the moment and I don't have to get on anybody's schedule to figure out how to make a difference in my community. But thank you for giving me this platform. I didn't expect it. I only came because I knew she was on the panel and I wanted to hear what was going on because, you know, that's just what I do. Anything AI, I try to connect to it as best I can. But thank you. Thank you so much, Chiwa, for your sharing and for what you do. Uh, it's so important for our country. So thank you so much. It's uh, already 2.56. I just want to pick one more question from the Q&A. In case if you submitted a question and we didn't get a chance to answer it, I will invite the panel group, provide some answers or uh, insights, and then we will email you. The last question I want to address here, John asked, uh, how can we get instructors to see AI as a learning tool that students can use to gain efficiencies and learn from using it? rather let its sole purpose being to cheat. And I think we partially covered it, but uh, for our uh, panel group, uh, do you have any more comments or sharing regarding this? I, I'm just going to go back to what I said earlier, which is to teach them to play, mm -hmm. to have a workshop where it's not necessarily academic focused. Talk about using AI to create a workout plan, to meal plan, to um, create images for Zoom backgrounds, to do all of the things not related to academics just so that they learn to use the tool. Because I think part of the um, the issue is that they don't understand the tool. And the more, if we don't get them to actually use the tool, they're never going to understand it. They're only going to hear words. And until they actually see the value in what it can do for them, they're not going to use it. They're not going to want to integrate it into their classroom. They're not going to want to let students use it as well. So I think that the key is removing the academic portion for faculty who are uh, who are intimidated and teaching them to use it for their personal use and whether like I said and and showing them how to create like a meal plan that was the the favorite thing that we did an AI day was I could say because everybody at five o'clock when somebody says well what do you want for dinner the answer is always I don't know right and well if you do this you you've you've just you you now have okay here are the five things that we are going to have this which one of the five do you want and then but it can also create you a um grocery list based on your so that saves you time and then see t and then doing all of those things and then they're like oh i see the value in this is as a tool i'm still the person putting the information in it but it's still it's a tool to help me personally and then once you once they have accepted that then it's much easier to have a conversation that follows that so um i, I really see and like i said we did a whole hour-long session on just I used the graphic designer and I did a t team did it um, just on making images and having fun and having them create stories about fairies and potions. And then how do you create a, a storyline based on that with a plot for a movie? And then we actually had it do lyrics for the intro song for the movie that we were going to do. And all of those things tied together made it very meaningful and then it became much easier for um, the faculty at the end to understand how it can be applied in their classroom. Thank and you. I would add, Tom, I'd like uh, to address the, the faculty who are using it, like they are into it. How can it 
right? We have those. In this, this session I did at TCA was packed full of special ed teachers who want to know how they could use AI to help take some of the, the stuff off their plates, right? So we showed them how to make schedules and we showed them how to send parent emails. And I've got this student, you know, student A needs to be in therapy these times during the day and math at this time. And they're here during this time, write a daily schedule that allows for this, this, this with a lunchtime at this time. And they had a daily schedule with all of the things that had to happen for that student as student A mixed in. But then I we kind of we we kind of conned them in there because we got them in for that. And then we showed them now. Here's how you can use it with your students. So we have books now, right? Your students need to email to you. Here's how you can show students to write prompts to help them write emails to their faculty. So that it's not, yo, what's up? I missed my homework. You gonna let me make it up or what? Now it's hi, I, I have been absent due to my football game and I need to make up my assignment. And, and it helps them to rewrite based on their audience and the content that they need. Um, we had it run social situations. We had it run all kinds of neat stuff. And, and the faculty went, oh my God, it's not only just for me, right? Because a lot of our faculty now, I think our total will agree with me, are kind of getting into how it can save them time, right? Save them energy. And a lot of times, and, and I'll just use the cell phone in the classroom thing in K-12, right? No cell phones for the kids, but mine is on my desk next to me. But now I'm not a big fan of, okay, for me, but not for thee. I'm a big fan of if I'm using it because in my job, it makes my life easier. Then I want to teach my students how to use it so that when they go to a job, it makes their lives easier. But we also have to teach those appropriate situations and when it's when it's okay and when it's not. So I, I love the idea of hitting those people who are, who are afraid to use it or don't want to use it by getting them out of their heads with the content and thinking about that. But then look at those people who have invested into how it can help them and use that as your door to get them into not just for you but for your students as well. I always tell my teachers, yeah, I talk to my faculty a lot. I'm like, you need to be giving your students resume fodder. And this is resume fodder. I know how to do these practical application things with AR. I can put that on my resume, just like we would if we had those skill sets. I mean, you don't see all these people on LinkedIn posting those classes and certificates for nothing, right? We're trying to learn, we're all, but we're also trying to promote our career and move forward. And we want that for our students as well. And Kim, oh. that's a great thing. The resume piece, we actually had an, an, in our second hour of practical application, we actually showed people how to take your resume and update your resume and take a job description and put it in. Again, not so that necessarily they would do it themselves, but then they could see how student, it would be very beneficial to students to find that job description, use the AI to create a resume that specifically fits and a cover letter, and then the whole process. And uh, there were a lot of people who were like, I had no idea you could do that. So we used our career and transfer person to talk about that. And then now faculty are aware, you know, hey, I can use this for myself. And because updating a resume is a task for sure. Well, and have your average college student put all of their due dates for all of their assignments and have it work a schedule out for them on when to, when to complete those so that they can help them with organization and time management, right? When we're losing those freshmen because they don't have those skills, use AI to teach them those skills. Right. There's I mean, there's a thousand examples. Right. But it all ties into those practical applications. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Kim, Paige. And thank you so much, everybody, uh, our panelists and uh, all our uh, audience members. This is great discussions. And it's so thrilled to learn all those good things happening on other campuses from our colleagues throughout the country and uh, uh, also uh, in other parts of the world. I am sure this is just the beginning of our conversation on this topic, and I am sure this is a very successful inaugurating session on this topic, and we will certainly have more follow-up sessions on this, and we will invite everybody coming back again to join us in this wonderful conversation. We just need more time. And so, so thank you so much, everybody. Really appreciate that. And I will let you go. I will see you again soon and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Goodbye.